Today we're doing a preliminary analysis, so I'll just be me, your host Fabio, and um, we're going to go over one of the stocks that we got requested on our website. So what we're going to be doing is trying to get this content out there, some preliminary analysis on these stocks that we have a request for. Today we're going to be uh, discussing one of those and keep an eye out for those for those other requests. And the way this is going to work throughout this series is basically we're going to do our preliminary analysis. It'll be the either Austin by himself or me by myself or us together. And we're gonna find out which ones interest us as we go through this preliminary analysis. And then that will basically make its way to a deep dive if it's something that interests us. So it's gonna be like a filtering process. So the one I'm gonna be discussing with you guys today is Newell Brands, all right? Ticker symbol NWL. So Newell Brands, you might know them for their brands such as Sharpie, Expo, and their other various brands like Mr. Coffee. So when we look at Newell Brands, we gotta understand what, what exactly we're dealing with. So Newell Brands is basically selling its products through peripherals such as retail locations. And so you go into the store, like think of uh, Office Depot. You go into Office Depot and you wanna get some pens, you wanna get some, um, uh, some paper, Okay, so then you want to make sure that the, the company is positioning itself ideally where these customers are going. And I'm mentioning that for a reason, because you might ask yourself, maybe I haven't been inside an office depot in quite a long time. Maybe I'm just getting my supplies from Amazon, right? And that's a valid point. And that's what I want you to kind of think about alongside me is basically that's some of the risks before we even continue uh, with this video that we have to be cognizant of and really think if Newell Brands management is taking steps or actions in order to mitigate this risk and maybe even better the company. So uh, I wanna actually show you some of the brands associated with Newell Brands. Um, and let's kind of quickly talk about some of them. So you can kind of see here on their website, this is free for everyone to see, they have some, they have Rubbermaid. Rubbermaid is a popular uh, brand in both uh, cleaning products food products as well. So I know that right here, the commercial products. And I'll go through them without talking too much because that would make the video too long. But as I go through this, you can kind of see whether or not you yourself may be familiar with some of their brands. Uh, you know about Elmer's Glue. I know that they capitalized on the whole sludge uh, market when kids were uh, into the sludge uh, or making sludge uh, with their parents. And um, I'm just looking through here. They have baby products. They have Nuke right over here, Baby Jogger. Uh, so a lot of these brands, I know they bought Yankee Candle. Yankee Candle was uh, trendy back in the day. I don't know if it technically still is. And they do have connected home security. So what you're looking at is just a brand, a bunch of brands held together under one company, Newell Brands. So one thing I also want to highlight, you might have seen here in the title, is Carl Icahn. He's a legendary investor or one of the legendary investors in the world. And he took a huge stake in Newell Brands because what he believed is he could unlock the alley. That's what Carl Icahn is actually famous for. He's famous for making these acquisitions and uh, acquiring them and basically trying to take the value out of the business or trying to realize the value. So that could be beneficial to us as shareholders, knowing that this individual also sees value in the company. And here he increased his stake. So he was adding for quite a while. If we take a look here, um, Newell Brands has actually been on a massive downtrend. So the company actually came out of the Great Recession really strong, right? And we can see here up to its peak, it almost went up 10x. We have 859% right in less than 10 years then they made a terrible acquisition that was a ceo who's no longer with the company well maybe it's debatable whether or not it was terrible but for the most part the consensus is it was bad so we'll actually try to see if we can see that in the numbers but the consensus i just want you to be aware of that it was a bad acquisition and that's uh this is a case study as to you as investors you have to be careful with what we call empire builders so when ceos believe that simply acquiring new businesses and making the business bigger is always a good thing. So think of AT&T and Time Warner acquisition. That was promising. This management said, look at all the things we can do. Look at all the synergies. They acquired DirecTV. Hindsight is 2020, and those were bad acquisitions. But you have to be aware of them or try at least to be aware of them in the moment it occurs because that they can lead to massive uh, destruction of shareholder value. 
Also, I, I do believe at the time around here, Newell Brands was trading at quite a premium because again, you have, again, when you have um, price appreciation, you have a factor of momentum, okay? So momentum can actually take that uh, stock price beyond what is reasonable. So after this correction, uh, during or around during this correction, this is where Carl Icahn began accumulating his position. And he changed the management and a bunch of other things with the company. So this is more or less a recovery play. Now, I want to take us through the model, and then we're going to actually see what kind of assumptions we can make. But first, before we begin, I want to take us through the ratios to try to get an idea or a grasp of this business, right? Uh, so right off the bat, I can see on the current ratio on a gap basis, they're, they're, they look pretty healthy. On a cash ratio, not, not so healthy, but that's understandable. The cash ratio is much more conservative. But on a current ratio, it looks like they can cover their current liabilities with current assets. It has been deteriorating, right? And you see here, in 2017, that's when that acquisition occurred. That's a, a strong deterioration of their position. And you can see here, you see, so what I'm trying to highlight here is the numbers are telling me that story, that that acquisition did harm the business on, on a balance sheet perspective from, from the health of the balance sheet. So we can see here total debt ratio, deterioration, long-term debt ratio, deterioration, uh, pretty much across the board deterioration. Uh, debt to equity, deterioration. So basically balance sheet got worse, right? Summary, balance sheet got worse. Gross margins also deteriorated. This is negative for the business. This actually means that whatever they acquired had lower margins. It harmed the operations of the business. Operating margins did improve though. So we did see deterioration here upon the acquisition, uh, but going forward, they seem to have been improving. That could be because Carl Icahn is changing up management, right? That could be because of that. I don't know. We'd have to do a lot more digging in the, in the deep dive. And the net profit margin, we can see here something occurred. This could have been a gap. So this is just gap accounting right here. But after that, we do see something going on here. This is probably some restructuring going on over here and something assembling, semblance of going back to normal. Uh, return on assets, return on equity, return on assets is pretty bad. Return on equity is decent, okay? It's getting better. It's actually improving quite a bit. This is good, but that's on a gap basis. Now we wanna see the earnings quality. So that's a separate metric that we kind of highlight here on the channel. Uh, that no, no one really talks about that one, but uh, basically the earnings quality, I like to see it positive uh, and the higher, the better. So it, it has been improving. And then going over here, we can see what the difference is between the gap accountants or not gap accountants, but gap accounting and, and cash flows. So cash flows seem to be pretty strong and improving. This is a positive sign. Gap accounting is reflecting the, on the accrual basis. Um, and therefore we can kind of see them match over time. So uh, there is, uh, this is a good sign for me. And I see the price to free cash flow. Price to free cash flow is pretty cheap. This business is actually quite cheap. So that I should see that reflected in the growth assumptions when we get to the um, uh, model. So this is kind of, if you're sitting at home watching this, this is kind of the place where you start to kind of figure out what discount rate you're going to apply. What are your expectations? What do you think this business is based on the risks? And then remember the last step is to figure out what's your allocation. After you figure out you want to buy something, the, the, the hardest part is then figuring out allocation because allocation determines your risk position and everyone's going to be different. So now looking at the activity ratios, because this business deals with inventory, it is actually a very important uh, place for us to look at. So for example, uh, we can see here that they have basically no improvement here, uh, no improvement here, and there is an improvement here. So that's like, that's good. Uh, and we want to make sure that this, okay, so this is getting lower. That's good. That means they're getting their cash faster. Um, and then this is, well, this is actually getting worse. This one's getting worse, but this one's getting better. So that, that's, that can be a good thing. So that maybe is because the nature of the, of the sales are changing. So we have to, we would review that in a deep dive to make sure that, well, how are their sales changing? Are they changing? Remember what I mentioned at the beginning of the video? We want to make sure that they're not going to become reliant on, on these big box retailers like Office Depot because maybe less people will go to them. Uh, that's just how things are changing. The, the company has to adapt to the consumer. And if the consumer is buying through Amazon, that can be a bad thing because Amazon may take a, um, a premium or not a premium, a commission for those sales. So we have to think about that 
uh, going forward. And I know a lot of businesses are actually struggling with that problem currently. So they're trying to get direct to consumer, but let's be honest, are you going to go to Newell Brands' website and buy the Sharpies right there? Maybe not. All right. So let's go actually and check out some of these uh, metrics. So let's first check out the um, Altman Z score. So an Altman Z score is decent. Okay. So that's basically telling me that it's unknown okay unknown at risk of uh bankruptcy right so that's why that's why this is returning an na it's based off of this calculation of the altman z score um and that's just a that's like a litmus test it's like a taste test it doesn't necessarily mean that there's a danger or anything like that it's just to check it out now what i want to know note is the uh price to free cash flow is lower than the pe that's because the pe is using the gap basis gap basis accounting Price free cash flow is just using cash accounting. Uh, book value per share, don't really care too much about this. It's, it's something to think about, but if this was trading below book value, that'd be pretty incredible uh, in this instance, because typically a business like this is gonna trade at a premium to book value. So it's nothing, no, nothing uh, out of the ordinary to see that. Return on equity is good, but we wanna see return on invested capital a little bit higher, hopefully above 15%, but that's still pretty good. It's not terrible. All right, and then we want to see low dividend payout ratio. This dividend payout ratio is based off of uh, cash flows, actually, not, not even gap net income. It's based off of cash flows. So uh, that's that's good. That's a good uh, percentage. I like to see that. So that means they're able to increase that if they so desire, or uh, basically they have plenty of cash to reinvest in the business. So going up to the model here, let's actually uh, assume the 20% standard, and let's assume some buybacks. Let's assume, let's take a look at what they've averaged out. So about 3%. So let's actually assume a 2% buyback. And then for the growth rates, I think for this company, if we take a look at what the analysts kind of believe here on this website, they aggregate some sort of uh, assumptions here. Uh, I'd say, I'd, I'd feel comfortable with saying uh, between three to 10% going forward over the next 10 years. So three, and then let's do four, five, let's skip to seven, and let's do 10 at the end. Okay, so now I'm kind of getting an idea of what these assumptions are basically telling me. So basically, if I'm assuming less than 10%, I probably can believe or assume an 8% to a 9%. So let's actually assume 8% and 9% and nine there. Okay, so just above between 9 and 10% is what I have to assume if I'm requiring a 20% rate of return. Now, if I'm reinvesting the dividends, I'm going to be actually accumulating greater sums of shares over time. And some people believe that the, the buyback calculators or should not uh, include the uh, dividends. And that's not necessarily the case because it will not factoring in taxes. You have to uh, think about that as well. But let's assume taxes is not an issue in this case. Then it's simply a return of capital, but in a different form. So both are returns on capital and both take up the cash flows. Buybacks take up the cash flows and dividends take up cash flows. So in essence, I want to uh, include the dividends in my buyback assumptions if I want to reinvest those dividends. And let's say uh, that I am, and I'm going to reinvest the entirety of the dividend. So then I'm going to, let's say I'm capable of buying around 4% back of the uh, shares uh, each year. So now my assumptions become a little different. So now I can see that I can assume 8% rate of uh, growth and I can still um, consider this a buy. I can probably uh, squeeze out probably 5% assumption or even 6%. There we go. So 6% assumption actually ends up working. So uh, I am actually very comfortable with assuming 6%. So basically from this video, this is again a preliminary analysis. What I'm seeing is I'm actually interested and I will be uh, bringing this up to Austin. I'm interested in doing further research and if you might have seen Austin's uh, new video where he did uh, Albertson's video, and Austin has been, uh, the, the level of growth I've seen in Austin is quite incredible. So I just want to speak to that for, for a quick moment. So when he first started investing, which is fairly recently, um, he, he, he took his accounting background and he was able to pick things up very quickly. So you can kind of see how now he's kind of segueing and he's becoming uh, a, his whole uh, different kind of investor all on his own. And it's quite fantastic. So now as you, you're gonna, you guys are going to see his journey go from moderately beginning, and then he's going to accelerate really quickly because I'm working with him and I'm, I'm 
basically uh, giving him everything I know and basically giving him the accelerated track course into, into investing. And he's going he's gonna to make it in, uh, or he's going to get a very large portfolio one day. So, but with that being said, we're going to do a, a deep dive on Newell Brands. I'm going to add that to the list of uh, what we're going to do as a deep dive, because for me, this receives our stamp of approval um, so far in the preliminary analysis. And I actually would like to uh, perhaps think about adding this to my portfolio at current prices. All right, guys. So uh, don't forget to actually go to our website uh, to capitalmindset.org. You can also submit a request. You don't have to uh, put your real name. Uh, that doesn't really matter. The point is you can um, uh, leave us a ticker symbol, tell us a little bit about the company, why you're interested in it. And then basically we, we will do one of these preliminary videos. And then if it piques our interest further, uh, we're going to do a deep dive on it because then the deep dive serves as like the research for us also to then think about, okay, is this going to make it into our our, our personal portfolios. And then at the same time, these preliminary uh, videos kind of also serve as a filter to say, okay, well, that one's a little too complicated, too many assumptions over there. Um, so we can kind of hone or focus more on the ones that we are interested in. And some of them we're going to miss, obviously, but that's, that's the name of the game. We are going to focus on the ones that we think are understandable on our behalf and then therefore that we can make accurate assumptions going forward so again don't forget to go to the website and actually uh leave leave a suggestion if you would like on a stock you'd like us to do a preliminary analysis on go feel free to actually read the articles that we have there we post articles as much as we can on there all free no paywalls and uh feel free to put a comment down there right now we're still a small channel and uh, we're, we're we're able to respond more readily to to all the comments that we see and if you guys like this video, please uh, share a like. It actually helps us with the YouTube algorithm, lets us get a little bit bigger here, there every day, and uh, keeps us going, keeps us motivated to make new content for you guys. All right, guys. Thank you, and have a good one.